Bill A, please un please mute your microphone.
for a moment. How rich a computer company you could be if you could make stuff simple. Just take one. Unmute microphone. Oh my gosh. How do you get that? Oh, there you go. So this is what she looked like in um, June of 2015, and you can see this really thick verrucoid looking leukoplakia there. Here's another shot of some of it. And she'd had a biopsy done before she came to see me, and this is what it came out as. You know, it, it doesn't say anything really about lichen plants, right? Lichenoid mucositis, verrucoid leukoplakia, basically. <laughs> What's the word lichenoid mean? So we have something, and I have another slide on that, by okay. the way. I have another slide on oral lichenoid lesions, and it's something that looks like lichens. <laughs> lichenoid, right? Like looks like lichen planus, but isn't. <clears throat> but again, I'm not so sure these things are separate entities. But when you don't get the immunohistochemistry that you often see with lichen plant or lichen planus, then you call it lichenoid mucositis instead. So these are her visits. Um, when I first saw her, she had these widely disseminated leukoplakic patches. She reported that she'd been tested before and she was allergic to nickel and palladium, which really wouldn't have had anything to do with fillings because fillings, her fillings that she had received were plastics. They were composites, not really metals. But she had some crowns in there that probably had nickel and palladium in them. Um, and these are the things that I saw. Um, she had a lot of leukoplakia, really, not, not, not the reticular stri that you see in lichen planus or the atrophic erythematous stuff that you see, but really leukoplakias. So our, um, stop that. I get that to go away. So our, uh, again in December, um, and then again in March, when I see patients with uh, a lot of leukoplakia or patients with uh, a fairly heavy presence of oral lichen planus. First, maybe 15 years that I was following these patients, I would follow them, which is with what is thought of as the standard of care. I'd see them every six months for a light case, I mean, uh, uh, for a heavy case, a fairly involved case, once a year for a light case. And then one day I said to myself, well, you've had two patients die because you didn't, as you know, there's a malignant transformation rate for oral lichen planus and for leukoplakias. And um, so I didn't catch a couple of cases early enough and a couple of patients died and a couple of other patients had really important resections of their mandible or their tongue. And so I arbitrarily, without evidence basis, started seeing people every three or four months if they're fairly involved and every six months if they're not. And a number of my colleagues around the country who also do a lot of mucosal disease think I'm nuts, but I haven't had anybody die since then and I've caught a whole lot of small squamous cells. So I think I'm doing the right thing. Um, we have some tools. I'm not sure if you've heard of the Velscope, but you see Velscope negative. I'm gonna show you something about that. And then at the next visit, consider tall blue, toluidine blue. I don't know if you guys use that on the dermis or not, but it's used to help detect um, cancers in the mouth. And I'll show you a little slide or two about that. So this is the Velscope. I know you're not supposed to use company names at this talk, but I can't help it, there's only one telescope. So it's a pretty simple thing. Um, when you look at normal mucosa with it, the mucosa fluoresces when it's got basically too much chromatin in it, which is kind of the definition of cancers. It, it, it's dark. And here is a clinical picture of that. So, you know, you'd never know that there was something going on in here but with the velscope. There's clearly something going on there. So I use this a lot when I'm looking especially at leukoplakias and, and at normal tissue in people that have mucosal disease. I went ahead and patch tested her. This is the panel I use. There are 30 allergens on there. Len mentioned metals, and I do include all the metals that are used in dentistry, but I also throw in a, a whole lot of the methacrylates and hardeners and softeners and rate limiters and that kind of thing that are used in dental materials as well. And as you can see, um, sure enough, 
nickel and palladium. So that confirmed <coughs> what she had told us before. So here are more pictures of what she looked like initially. These, whoops, some of those are kind of light. Sorry about that. But you can see these really thick leucoplachic patches that are what we call verrucoid. Um, to me, uh, I like the word corrugated better because it, it's more descriptive. So I didn't want to do another biopsy, but her PCP ordered another biopsy. And as you can see again, it, it, it says at the bottom, no features of lichen planus. So I think it's important to understand that we're not really dealing with lichen planus, rather leucoplachia. And it's pretty widespread in this particular patient's mouth. So over time, it seemed to be increasing. Velscope kept coming up negative. Um, I did a tall blue, and I'll show you a picture of it. And there was an area of concern on the left buccal mucosa, which is why I did it. It could have been cheek biting. You'll see this picture. But it also could have been a squamous cell that was firing up in that area. Um, she thought that it had um, resolved with the use of topical steroid. I didn't think so. Uh, this is the area that was troubling to me. This is all leucoplachic in here, sheet-like leucoplachia, but there's this sort of ulcerated reddish area here. Any place that's erythematous or has a lot of vascularization is going to look dark under the velscope anyway, so the velscope's no good for that kind of thing. It's good for all this other area, but not there, because it's going to look dark, but tall blue is a good test. So I did tall blue, and you can see there's very little or no uptake here. This sort of scattered uptake is any, you're going to get that any place you've got a little bit of hyperkeratosis or cheek chewing or whatever, and the dorsum of the tongue is always going to take it up. Here's a, this is not her, but here's an example of what real uptake would look like. So that's what I was looking for, didn't see it, and felt like there was no important reason to do a biopsy in that site. So by March of 2018, these leucoplachias are really very thick. And I mean, they're, they're spreading. And um, when I see patients like this, after having done this for so long, and I know this isn't scientifically perhaps um, correct, but I say to myself, it's not a question of, are they going to get a squamous cell? It's when are they going to get a squamous cell? Somewhere in here, because that really is about how it seems to go. So why didn't I think it was lichen plants? Well, OLP uh, can look like lichenoid reactions, contact reactions, drug eruptions. You know, the ACE inhibitors can produce things that look like lichen plants, for example. It, the uh, uh, immunopathology starts, uh, the current state of the art algorithm says, starts with an unknown antigen. And we have no idea what that is. It can be symptomatic or non-symptomatic. We know stress is a progenitor of it often. We know that there are reactive T lymphocytes. HCV seems to have a strong association. It's more common in women. And these are all presentations. When I teach um, students about lichen planus, I tell them it can look like anything. And I show them lots and lots of pictures of lots and lots of patients. And it really can look like anything. I know we're taught to think that it's the reticular stuff. But it really, it, it can just look like anything. And there is a transformation rate. This particular slide I borrowed from somebody. They've got 0.2%. They said that was done from a systematic review. Um, all, all the literature I've seen indicates it's between 1% and 4% lifetime risk, somewhere in there. So higher than what this says. And as you may know, um, women can have um, vulvar or vaginal involvement as well. And there's cutaneous involvement. So. The clinical diagnosis says you've got to have reticulum or papules. <clears throat> I think, again, it can look like anything, so I'm not wild about that definition. Because you can have erythematous uh, OLP with almost none of that. It can look like discoid lupus. It can look like benign mucous membrane pemphigoid, leucoplachia. Have this kind of um, stuff in the biopsy, the h &E biopsy, and then in the immunofluorescence. And you want to rule out lichenoid reactions to either materials or, or drugs, or if you know there's been a transplant, GVHD. So basically, you're just making them feel better. You're not going to cure this. You're just trying to keep, keep them able to eat foods, 
um, able to brush your teeth, and able to be fairly comfortable. Um, there are all kinds of things we use. I use mostly topical steroids. I stay away from tacrolimus. I don't like it. And cyclosporin. Um, use retinoids a little bit. UV therapy is on this slide. It's very little used. In this half of the country, it's used a lot back east. And systemic steroids, of course, when you really just, when it's out of control. And it's just ulcerated, ulcerated all over the mouth, and they can't eat, and they can't sleep. Um, it's very clear that there's something going on about plaque that seems to make the reaction worse. That hasn't been researched yet, but it's obvious that if you, to me, that if you keep the mouth clean, the lichen planus uh, is a whole lot better. Leukoplakia, it's an oral white lesion that's not something else. <laughs> I like that very much. Um, it's called rucus if it's, quote, dominated by papillary projections. I just like the word corrugated, as I said before. Doesn't hurt most of the time, it's just there. And it's got a pretty significant transformation rate, as I was saying, depending on which studies you look at. Um, says biopsy required. Well, you know, sure, but when it's all over the mouth, where the heck are you supposed to biopsy? If you biopsy over here, it might be transforming over here. So I think tall blue and the velscope are really important diagnostic tools to figure out where to biopsy. We know that there's something about these genetic changes that seem to make it occur. It's fairly common, and it's not more common in women than men, like lichen planus is. And so you want to confirm it's not something else, like somebody just chewing their cheek all the time and creating this hyperplastic sort of whitish thing. When you biopsy, this is what you're going to see. Smoking and drinking, of course, increase the malignant transformation rate. And uh, there are, depending on what part of the country you're in, there are surgeons that are very happy to laser all this off or strip it all off with the idea that if you've removed it, you can't get hurt um, by a, a transformation, but it comes back with great frequency. And, you know, lasering it off or stripping it off is really a big deal for the patient, even if you do it in quadrants or, or areas. This is my protocol. I want to see them every three months for the first year until I kind of get to know their mouth, and then at least every six months. What about chewing tobacco? You say smoking and drinking, but what about people who chew? Yeah, so thank you. Chew and dip and all that stuff um, definitely produces leukoplakias for sure um, in the area, you know, the snuff dippers pouch that they get. Um, there are other tissue changes in the area as well, but yeah, if you chew, dip, or, or, or put snuff in, you're going to get a leukoplakia sooner or later. Any change or a positive tall blue or a positive L scope, you should definitely biopsy. So back to the patient. So um, we're up now to uh, September of 2018, and I'm just calling it Verrucus leukoplakia. OLP, oral lichen planus, is on the diagnostic list, but only because eh, maybe this is a, a type of OLP, even though the biopsies weren't indicative of it. Um, so at that point, I had started to think about low-dose naltrexone based on another case that I'd seen and based on seeing some stuff in the literature, and I thought, well, you know, if it's, for example, there's a paper, pretty good paper, on looking at the pemphigoides and the use of low-dose naltrexone. And um, seems to be working. And I thought, well, it's going to be hard to hurt somebody with low-dose naltrexone, so let's try it. So I thought, let's put her on it. Ordered an autoimmune screen just to see if I was missing something. So here we go, low-dose naltrexone, the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and if you go Googling about this, you're going to find it's got cult following at this point all over the place. Um, Here's a paper from this particular journal, Promising Treatment in Immune-Related Diseases, Multiple Sclerosis, Crohn's, Hashimoto's. I mean, if it's autoimmune, they're going to throw this at it these days. So I thought I should, too. Um, this is the mechanism, and I don't like the mouse to do this, but basically, when you're using it high-dose naltrexone for the normal uses, this this is the mechanism right over here. 
but at very low doses, it turns out to do something completely different to all these sets of cells, which is why it seems to work for these autoimmune conditions. And you could, you could certainly go check this out later and read more about the mechanism. Um, but we don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it here, but you guys probably know it's used for drug withdrawal at high doses, but it's being used for all these conditions um, at very low doses, typically anywhere between um, three to five milligrams a day. And uh, in Puget Sound, at least, when you get it compounded at these very low doses, um, it only runs about a buck and a quarter a day, wow. which is amazing. You know, it's, a, it's almost like a, a, a deal. Um, and all the pharmacies are, are doing this for about a buck and a quarter a day for, for the patients. So just back to the mechanism about this. This um, paper that's referenced down here um, is easy to find in case you want to, you've got the slides, I think, in case you decide you want to look at that paper and the paper that I showed it a few minutes ago. Then <coughs> so you can read all you want about it. I'm just curious, are people seeing this being done? Yeah, has anybody, oh, but, but you've heard of it or no? The whole LDN? I had one. Well, you're going to. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that patients will come in with some weird symptom complex and ask me if I'll give them low-dose naltrexone, and I'm like, I don't know what you're even talking about. <laughs> and I'm having more and more patients show up already on it. No, I can't say that. But not for, not for my purposes. You know, they'll come in with Crohn's, and they're on LDN, or they'll come in with Hashimoto's, and they're on LDN, or they've got fibromyalgia, and they're on LDN. And so... Next, it's measles, like I said. So. <laughs> um, her autoimmune panels were unclear. There were no smoking guns anywhere. Pretty normal. She, however, had been, she'd had a long history of Raynaud's, and it was getting much worse. Her immunologist didn't seem to know what was really going on. But she be, so I put her on 4.5 a day in 9 of 2018. And... So this were, these were, the, I don't have pictures from 9 of 2018, but I have pictures from when I first saw her. And this is really that very thick leukoplakia. And this is only four months after she started. And this is already thinning out very dramatically in these areas. And the, uh, some of the other areas are too. And if you look at her palate, she had really significant thick verrucous leukoplakia all over the place. And it's dramatically reduced. Now, is it the LDN that did it, or is it <clears throat> some other metabolic process going on in her own body or immunologic process going on in her own body? I don't know that I know, but this is a pretty dramatic response. Is that the only therapy? And she wasn't on steroids or anything else? That, that this was the only change made um, at all. And you know, I've seen, like I said, thousands of these cases over the years, and these thick leukoplakias, particularly the verrucous ones, they don't do this. They don't suddenly remit. They just don't. Now, never say never in medicine, right? Maybe hers did just remit. But so um, I'm due to see her again now, uh, and we'll see what it looks like coming up. But that's, that's pretty dramatic. Uh, and so I thought, well, if it's good PO, let's try it topically as well. And so uh, I decided to add topical to it. And I haven't even heard of this being done before. But, you know, universities are supposed to be hotbeds of Looney Tune ideas. And, um, uh, you know, oral medicine is no exception. We do a lot of Looney Tune things um, and off-label things because we see all the patients that nobody else seems to be able to do something with. So uh, I just made this up, having 50 milligrams crushed into 20 mils of water, and then once a day, swish with five mils for it. We'll see what happens. You, you can find, when you Google, you can find people starting to use topical naltrexone for other things, but, but not like this, and certainly not for leukoplakia. Now, this is the case that actually brought this to my attention. And I, I'm showing this one second instead of first, because 
the first ca the case I just showed you is kind of more interesting, but I saw this woman um, in 2017. I think I first saw her then. Uh, she had a 22 year history of what they called OLP, oral lichen planus, but again, it was mostly leukoplakia. Uh, and there was no real good biopsy confirmation that this was oral lichen planus. Oral lichen planus is typically a lot easier to calm down with topical steroids. Leukoplakias of any sort never respond to topical steroids, which is why I got so interested in this LDN thing. And she had been on LDN since February of 17 uh, for her Hashimoto's. Now this was her uh, in 8 of 2017. She'd been on it for what, six months by that time. And I don't have a previous picture. And this is her, what would that be? Se seven months, go away. Seven months after um, starting on the LDN. And she had, look at this really thick leukoplakia here that's simply gone, or almost completely gone. And I, unfortunately, you can't see the dorsum of her tongue, but the dorsum of the tongue here was leukoplakic, and she had this pretty clear, long, stringy leukoplakic patch here that's still a little visible here, but, but changed. The other side of the tongue, likewise, sorry this is so faded, but uh, if I photoshopped it, you'd see that this thickened, super thickened patch here and all this stuff down here was really thinned out very significantly. And I think I have her palate. Palate's not as dramatic as the last patient, but the uh, this patch here does exist in this photograph. You just can't see it very well. But you can see how a lot of what is here is gone. It's just gone. Here's a clearing patch here. Here's a clearing patch here. So again, it, would she have changed like this without being on LDN? I don't know. But I, normally, when these leukoplakias occur, this does not happen. <clears throat> so, so that's LDN. And I, you know, it's clearly um, a nascent sort of a treatment for all kinds of things. And this could be total coincidence. I've now got uh, seven patients on LDN for these leukoplakic things. And uh, three, four more years from now, I guess I'll know whether it's making a difference or not. Um, maybe sooner. So move on to the patch test stuff. Um, Mike, is it easier for you to tell the difference between lichen planus and leukoplakia? Because I keep looking at your slides thinking they're pretty much the same to me. Well, I haven't really shown any lichen planus yet. Okay, that would um, explain why they look the same. Yeah, these are, to me, these are leukoplakias. People send them in all the time calling them lichen planus, but to me it's, it's, it's really different. So you can tell without a biopsy when you see it? Not really. Uh, but, for example, both of these patients, well, the first patient had, had two biopsies. It just, there was just no hint at all of the typical things that are seen with lichen planus, histologically, right? But very much with leukoplakia. And there's the idea in mucosal disease that these reticular stri form inside the mouth, Wickham stri can coalesce and form leukoplakia. And they probably can, but not this thick sheet-like or even corrugated leukoplakias. I just, I just don't think of that. I think, I think it might be part of a spectrum of these, whatever this hell <laughs> we call like an oral lichen planus, but uh, you know. Has any patient stopped the LDN and had a worsening of the disease? You know, this hasn't been, neither of these have, and I've only got, I think, five more people on it, and it hasn't been all that long, because it's only been, gosh, a year that I've had anybody doing this. How did this whole phenomenon get started of using this for everything from soup to nuts? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, but that paper, when you read that paper, it looks like the uh, biochemists, or the biophysiologists, got the idea that at very low doses it functioned differently for the immune cells, and they thought, oh, huh, I wonder if we could use LDN to then change immune response and, and start experimenting with it. 
Um, so many, many years ago, I got interested in this dental materials and oral mucosal disease stuff and um, got a big grant from NIH to try to develop an intraoral patch test. I talked to you guys about this last time. Um, it didn't work, <laughs> which naturally it didn't work. We're, there's too much spit in our mouths to do an intraoral patch test. But I, I wound up getting trained by Marshall Welch over at Harborview um, and have been doing dental materials patch testing ever since and have tested hundreds of people now. And this is an update on uh, uh, the last, I forget, 230 patients or something, not all of which are included here because I've only included the ones that have either lichen planus or oral lichenoid lesions. Something that looks like lichen planus or is lichen planus, biopsy confirmed, if you will. But I also see people who, oh, maybe they get a perioral rash and somebody refers them in for patch testing. Frankly, I have a hard time seeing the relationship, but if they want to get tested, sure, we'll test them or their tongue burns, but there's no clear dermatologic response or mucosal response to it. So I'm not including those people. I'm only including patients where you can see something. Um, I use the ICDRG guidelines, um, the way Marshall does it and the way I do it. You put them on on day one, you take them off 48 hours later, do a first read, you do another read five days after that. And the Five day, you know, a lot of people don't do the five day later read or they do it two days later after, you know, after the initial read. But what I've learned is that the, um, especially the um, methacrylates and the, the big chain molecules, they easily can take until five days later to show you something. So at least for what I do, I stick to those um, guidelines. <clears throat> um, I get all my materials and allergens from Chemo Technique. Is that a Canadian company? That's the Canadian one, IOMED and Chemotechnique. Um, so, you know, in other words, they're not being compounded. They're the same ones everybody else is using, I think, um, is the Chemotechnique. Are you guys using a different? Frank, where are we getting all the newer ones? Yeah, I honestly, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's from Canada. Yeah. It's almost got to be Chemotechnique. The, the first thing you said is already important. I don't know, is anybody in this room so you're doing it in 48 hours and then a week, essentially, seven days. After the initial application. Is anybody routinely doing a week reading? Not unless there's a hint of something. Yeah, so are we making a mistake there? Not for the metals. Huh? Not for the metals. For the metals the show up pretty fast. Although there's a new palladium allergen, um, you know, palladium chloride's been the one that's be been used, and there's I think it's palladium tetrahydropallidate or sodium tetrahydropallidate or something that's a new palladium allergen that, that I added. And um, it's more sensitive. I use both of them now. And the palladium chloride can take until the week, whereas that tetrahydropallidate or whatever it is, that, that often shows up at 48 hours if you're looking for metals. But the, the plastics, they, take, uh, they can take a long time to show up. So it depends whether you're testing for plastics or not. I'm sure this looks familiar. <clears throat> yeah, don't, you don't have to pay much attention to this table because I'm going to show you a graph, and I like graphs a lot better. I just wanted you to see the ends. So there were 184 people included in this particular graph, set of graphs I'm going to show you, 136 women, 48 men, chromium, mercury, cobalt, gold, nickel, titanium, copper, palladium, aluminum, and tin. And I only added the second palladium about six months ago, so there aren't that many people included in this who responded positively to palladium that had been tested to both palladiums. But I've been using, uh, for, for the sake of this particular analysis, uh, I'm using uh, a response to the more sensitive one, for what that's worth. And titanium um, just got added about two years ago because where is most titanium implanted in the world? Dense. You know, they're putting in tens of millions of titanium implants um, every year. So here's what it looks like. And this is just comparing men and women. And I think kind of a shocker <laughs> is that gold is by far the most common allergen. And every dentist is taught that gold is so biocompatible, it's the ideal material, you know, it's it's never a problem. Um, and when the study gets published, um, 
I'm going to move to Indonesia or somewhere because I'm not going to be real popular here in the States. Um, and and you, you expect nickel, of course, to be an issue, and cobalt. Um, I don't think people expect palladium to be uh, as big a deal as it is, and chromium. And I also don't know how to explain the differences between gender. Um, but I haven't looked in the literature very much. Um, maybe maybe some of you guys are aware of gender differences for this, but uh, I just did this analysis um, a couple weeks ago. And so, but here's the really interesting thing. So you're the male and females again. But I also, along with one of my graduate students, um, spent hundreds of hours looking at hundreds of background studies, let's call them. Now, there are very, very few studies that have ever been done to get the true background rates of positive responses, because who's going to run around and patch test a bunch of normal people? You just don't do that very much. But there have been a few. So what I'm calling general population is actually a weighted means where we used, oh, I think, 100 and some odd studies uh, to look at the positive responses. A lot of those were from the European Reporting Group, where they have this great reporting every year of all the positive patch responses. And those are all in people with, who've gone in for patch testing for any reason whatsoever, right? Not necessarily oral or whatever, but <clears throat> so this is not even, these are not even necessarily the general population. These are people that went in for some reason. And even then, look at the comparison of my people with oral lichenoid lesions or oral lichen plants compared to the general pop rates. These are amazingly significant differences. Um, and for the sake of the manuscript, I thought to myself, OK, Michael, you've done all the reads yourself. What if you're just biased, right? What if, what if I've just screwed up and I'm overcalling things? And I try really hard not to overcall things. So I don't have a graph for this. But even if I take out all the ones, the one pluses, it's still dramatically different than the general population. So I don't think I could be overcalling it that much that this is wildly off the mark. I think there's something about lichenoid changes in the mouth, whether it's lichen plants or oral lichenoid lesions, that is real. And that is a response to all these dental metals that people have in their mouth, and amazingly, gold um, being the biggest problem. Are all those metals put in people? Um, I don't usually think of stuff like tin. And uh, tin and aluminum uh, aren't used in, in dental materials, everything else. Good question. All the other stuff is put in some kind of material? It is. Crowns, for example, are almost always a combination of gold, palladium, and then they, they either add a cobalt, chromium, or, or nickel for hardness, because the, you know it's too soft otherwise. Uh, and uh, there are all these um, proprietary alloys that are used. Uh, and it's easy enough to find the MSDS sheets for those and learn what's in any given crown. Do they still use stannous fluoride at all in toothpaste, or is it all sodium fluoride now? I, I don't know uh, what the current rate of use is. Good question. And the general population positives, was there a strong correlation with dental work? You know, there, 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 some of the studies looked at were dental studies, looking at lichenoid so, mucositis. Um, so there, but, but, uh, I didn't include those. I specifically left those out. You wonder, um, well, tin sorry. used to be used in. Can mercury. I ask a question? Yes. You wanted the difference between the male and female. Could that be due to the early introduction of piercings in, in girls? Like Boy, that's brains? a great thought. I wonder mm -hmm. if that's what explains that. Each other. Um, that, that, I, that might explain a lot. In, in, in addition to that, Mike, there is an article about Swedish women by the age of 30, one-fourth of Swedish women can't wear jewelry anymore. And it was in an orthopedics journal because they're looking at people that don't tolerate implanted hmm. joints. And the comment was the piercings that started, and this whole thing has just evolved hmm. since then. I like it. <laughs> as long as you're not a Swedish woman. <laughs> yeah. uh, so here are a couple. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I, you'll get to this, I know, because I asked you earlier. We, of course, don't deal with oral medicine, but we're always asked as allergists to help orthopedists especially figure out why a joint failed and how well we can extrapolate what we do to give them an answer. So you, you can move along and get through it whenever you choose, but that's 
That's where we interface all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know all that much about the orthopedic end of things. I've, I've been asked to test a few people um, who had uh, issues with newly or relatively newly implanted joints. Some of them were really obvious, like a guy that had, he had had a horrible accident and he had uh, metal in the ankle, metal in the knee, metal in the shoulder, maybe metal in the elbow also, and he had a very obvious dermatitis over all those areas. Sure enough, he tested positive cobalt chromium and that, the joints were those. Um, he had them replaced with titanium, to which he did not test positive, and the dermatitis went away very quickly. So that one's obvious. That we don't know yet, because there aren't very many of us doing this, the relationship between a positive test on the back and a, and a, a lichenoid or, or, or lichenoplast response in the mouth. You know, it, it's, it's hard to know. But I'll show you some cases that would indicate that there's a pretty strong relationship, that if you have a positive response back here and we take the that whatever it is that metal out of your mouth your mouth's going to get better um so i can answer th that about the relationship between oral and positive patch test responses um i did review i think i mentioned i reviewed one article recently uh, looking at orthopedic implants and the reliability of patch testing compared to uh subsequent treatment, removing the joints, and it looked like a pretty high uh, correlation. Not perfect, but pretty high. And I don't remember a number on it. Maybe it sounded like the article you read was kind of related to that. And I mean, they didn't correlate that. There was just a comment that, that was the finding that they made. Yeah. They just couldn't tolerate joint implants. I'm curious what the rest of you do. I mean, I tell people when they come with a failed joint and we patch test them, that the test is meant for a skin rash, not meant to tell you anything about implanted metal, but this is the best we have and we do it. And I find that very frustrating that we're extrapolating and we really don't have any data, but I don't know what else to tell people and I don't know whether to tell orthopedists to remove a joint. I mean, if it's failed and the person is crippled, they, they gotta do what they have to do. But, there's a company that you can send stuff to called Orthopedic Analysis, and they'll actually do blood testing, right. and they'll do lymphocyte transformation assay to metals. Right. It's about $90 a metal, and they'll do packages for like $750. But they don't have any controls either. They're just yeah. saying, this is what your lymphocytes are doing. So they use that as a guide. But I don't know if that's any better than this. I don't either. Than that's like you, anybody... you know, there, there are some studies out that have looked at, done um, immunohistochemistry on removed tissue that came out with removed implants that had failed and they find a pretty high immune response and I, I can't tell you what cell types they looked at and what um, chemicals they looked at but but um, there's also been a pretty high correlation in those realms as well has anybody tried with patch testing to use like a laser reflectometer or some kind of thermal imaging or something to actually see if you could quantify a patch test <laughs> instead of just this one, two, three yeah. that we use now? Um, not that I know about it. stuff. <laughs> but it's a wonderful... I don't, know, I don't know the answer to any of this stuff. <laughs> it's a wonderful idea. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't use um, Sharpies. I use a yellow highlighter, mm. which Marshall Welch taught me to do. And then we use a UV light to to have the, the artist, the patient's friend or husband, to, to retrace the grid every day. So they come back five days later, I shine my UV light, and bingo, I can see exactly where um, you know, the lines were drawn and I don't get black stuff all over the, the place. It's a really great, and they sell these little UV flashlights for like eight bucks at every hardware store. It's, it's a really nice tool. Um, and it's just plain old highlighters. Um, so you're saying even though the patch has been removed and visually you can't see much, you can highlight exactly where the patches were. Right, I draw on them the minute I take the patches off yeah. and then I have somebody do it every day. After that, I send home the flashlight and a marker. Um, and when they come back, it's wonderful because I don't have all this gray Sharpie stuff all over the place. Um, but this goes to your question. I have noticed hundreds of times that the UV light, you can see things you can't see with the naked eye where the responses should be. And I don't know what that means, uh, whether it's just chemicals still there. You just wonder if you could find a, mon a measurement that had better sensitivity than just visual, if you could right. look at some thermal image or some kind Thermal's of a great idea. ultraviolet image. 
But we mm. give all our patients Sharpies. We're too cheap to give them uh, the highlighters are cheaper. <laughs> Sharpies are only 45 cents. But the, oh, but then you got to get the flashlight back. And I have had about mm, 15 flashlights never come back. <laughs> okay, here are a couple quick, a uh, couple cases. 60-year-old female, persistent tongue lesion, um, and you can see, man, it's just right there. She actually had one on each side. She had had this lesion, these lesions, for many years. She was absolutely convinced this was recurrent yeast infection, candida. And she insisted on being treated with Diflucan over and over and over and over and over, over the years, probably 20, 30 times, and I'm not exaggerating. And every time, it would kind of go away. Well, Diflucan also has potent anti-inflammatory properties, and so, you know. Um, but I thought, hmm, you know, this, this isn't making sense to me. And that, of course, looks like a lichenoid lesion. It's not thick leukoplakia, it's the striae and the central so they're all serrated. So this was her. Gold was pretty good. Oh, there's the there's the highlighter. You can see the yellow highlighter. And that gold's a you know dominant reaction. Um, there's the others. So they're both sides. Big lichenoid lesion right there. Big lichenoid lesion, including an ulceration later. There and that ulceration would come and go. So uh, she had ceramics done on the left side eight months ago, and this thing's all but gone. There's little ulceration there. The other side is worse, much worse, where the gold still exists. The right side still has gold. Doesn't like me now. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying. Oh, oh, boy. Uh oh, he's got that circle. Oh, circle. Oh, good. Circle. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody back. Or, or circling the drain. Restart. Restart. Restart? Oh, wait. No. Let's wait for wait the program to respond. Wait for the program to respond. This is all. This is all due to LDN, I am sure. Keep <laughs> talking. <laughs> Oh, boy. You got to the start oh, now. Yeah, you got to start the program. program. Yeah. Oh, wait. No, no, it's not. It's going back. Oh, look at that. Come on. Oh. It's doing it by itself. Thank you. OK, <laughs> right side still has gold. Um, this is a similar case, but without the yeast infection, without the candida. Um, you can see the reticulations, the lichenoid thing right next to that. Um, she was tested positive to both palladium and gold, had them replaced with ceramics, and you can see it's all but gone five months later. So, so at least in the mouth, and this, this is, these are just two of many, many, many cases where if the patients had the means or the energy to have things replaced, um, their mouth improved if they tested positive. Now, a lot of people, they'll come in, they've got 15 crowns in their mouth. <laughs> You know, and they test positive to some of these things. And so they're looking at $50,000 and lots of time in the dental chair. And they'll decide, I'm not doing that. They'll just live with it, right? And use topical steroids if it bothers them or that kind of thing. So, I mean, it's, not, it's, it's hard to know what would happen in those kinds of cases. And here's another thing. It doesn't have to be, it does, it, the definition of oral lichenoid lesion typically says it has to be topographically related got to be right next to it. Simply not true, um, it, based on the many, 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 many cases I've done. Uh, and I think the deal is saliva is a really good electrolyte. So you get these ions from the crowns floating around all over the place and affecting the tissue all over the place. And so there's another one. Same idea. You can see pretty good lichenoid reaction going on right there. All but gone. I know this is bleached out a little bit. So back to the orthopedic question. So pretty well convinced me that metal testing on the back is a good predictor of metal in the mouth. And by extrapolation, I would accept sort of metal implanted anywhere in somebody's body. What, what about the plastic? So most of the time when we get an orthopedic referral, we'll do a panel of metals 
I don't think we know anything about the glues or other things that the orthopedists use to implant these things. That's a wonderful question. The, the plastics, every time I test somebody, I tell them, and good news, you can have a joint <laughs> replaced because they are the exact same with acrylates um, that are used when they glue things in for the joints as are used in the mouth, but, but, or mixes of them, right? Again, they're proprietary mixes of all of these different methacrylates, the hardeners, softeners, rate limiters, and all that kind of stuff. But the, the panel that, that I'm using really covers the bases. <clears throat> and uh, and I've, I've, I've had a few patients who inadvertently found out that they would, <laughs> who were about to get replacements, hips or knees, that they really should not do that they should have them screwed in instead of glued in because they responded so violently to the, to the can, plastics. Can we get that list? I'm not sure that we're doing the plastics and the glues properly. We you know what it is? Metals. It's the chemo technique um, dental materials panel. So it comes in a panel of 30. I've taken out some things though that are useless and put in some other things. And, and I'd, I'll email it to you. Um, yeah, uh, that would be great, and I can share it amongst our community here. But Frank, I don't, we're, I don't think we're doing a proper job with the glues. We I just do the metals, right? I think we are. I have a nice you thing think is we are doing it properly. Yeah. Nice thing is they're trying to take Maybe the glue out of all that. the procedures. So huh? that's the nice thing is the ortho guys are trying to take the glue out of everything. They're trying not to cement any joints in anymore because that's always where the failure occurs is the impedance mismatch between the bone, the glue, and the joint is where everything fails. So they're trying to fenestrate all the posts so that they just grow bone in them. And they're trying to get um, cover them with uh, bioglass so that it actually encourages bone growth through the fenestrations. But they're trying to remove all the glue and all the methacrylates from all the orthopedic implants. So it may be a better problem so in the future. Much, and okay. the logic could just fail. Right. Pressure. Sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm -hmm. All right, well, <laughs> still, I think if you send that to me, it would be a help. I'll it's, distribute it to the Alex. Sure, it's, it's in one of these slides, but okay. I'm not sure it's my most current one, so let me let me send you that. And, uh, <laughs> so I do a lot of pack rafting, and this is on the Little Colorado. Yeah, one of my better moments. <laughs> <laughs> but those people who, who tested positive for gold, I mean, they have the gold implants. Have they ever reported history of reactions to gold? Like if they use, like if they ever use gold jewelry, for instance. I mean, it's hard to believe that they've never used. Uh, it, they never had their reaction. This is a great question. Uh, much of the time, they'll say uh, that they can't wear gold either. Now they cannot what? That they can't wear gold. They can't wear any jewelry. They'll say, gosh, you know, I should have known this. Is it after the dental implant or before the dental implant? Well, I'm going to nitpick a little bit. Implants are, I'm using crowns, bridges, and fillings. The dental filling. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Because all the implants are just titanium. Before, they'll come in with a history that they knew this already. Now, not everybody, though. And I think there's probably, an, you guys would know better than I would, but I think there's probably an important dermal difference. And, and you know, allergens are specifically made to get through the dermis, right? Yeah. I mean, they're on purpose, whereas your jewelry is made to hmm, not do that. Um, and so I think maybe that's the important difference and why people will respond to a gold allergen, gold sodium thiosulfate, for example, but they can wear gold just fine. And then have you ever, like, have you, not, have you ever noticed, like, systemic contact dermatitis reactions with these metals? Um, no. Never. Okay. No, not in my experience. I, now, I have a lot of patients that believe they have systemic reactions right. to implanted metals and materials with all their heart. They believe that the reason they have fibromyalgia or you name it, is because they've got this darn mercury in their mouth or this darn palladium or whatever, or these plastics. Can't just move it. How good is the, uh, the uh, old true test? Like for example, I think an allergy clinic here at the university, in the allergy clinic, all that's available is the standard true test, not any of these special ones. We saw, I was attending one day when we saw a woman here with a failed knee joint 
And that's all we had to offer, just the metals that are in that 36 set compared to the I don't remember what's in the true test, to be honest. Nickel's in it, uh, gold is in it, cobalt's in it, about three or four metals, that's all. You know, for dentistry, if they don't have gold and palladium, they're, 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 it, they really need those. And titanium these days. I mean, does anybody compare the accuracy of oh. different companies' te te uh, test materials? That's, I don't know, great question. Do they still use gold crowns, or have they sort of fallen aside because of composites? No, I mean anymore. I just want to... that, that's a really great question. Um, yes, gold, gold is still by far the most widely used. Gold, palladium, nickel, chromium, alloys are by far the most commonly used thing. Not necessarily the full gold, like in my mouth, where you can say, look at this, ha, you know, it's a gold crown. But it's uh, a, a gold... I mean, a, a metallic base covered with porcelain baked onto it, but there's still metal rim that, that can leach ions out and does. Um, so either way, yeah, it's still by far. And having said that, just in the last, say, five years, a lot of dentistry is starting to use these um, ceramic blocks of zirconium, a uh, uh, zirconium ceramic material, and they use a laser interferometer, some kind of laser thing to... They don't take impressions anymore. They stick this thing in there and look at the crown prep, and then they software mills a crown <laughs> in a little machine right there in the office, and you get this beautiful zirconium crown to put on, and those are as inert as you can possibly get. Um, and they're strong enough now that they're, that they're considered fine. So that's, that's the future, and they're white, right? One of my patients is a jeweler, and he asked me if I knew what was in 14 karat gold, and I said, well, yeah, it's almost pure gold. He goes, no, it's 48%. Right, right, right. And it's 52% other stuff, which is cobalt, chrome, nickel, palladium, whatever else is in there. But I thought it was like pure gold, and he's like, no, it's too yeah. soft. So, pure gold is pretty soft, soft, isn't it? Yeah, 24 karat gold is like 85% gold, and that's too soft, so you use that. Just, uh, Curious question. Do you get to lecture to medical students? I mean, there's so much. I've always felt this distinction between dental school and medical school. There's an awful lot of mouth that doctors should know and don't, don't know anything about. It. We don't have a look in people's mouths for disease. Um, and yet it's a good reflection of systemic medicine. Oh, yeah. Anybody in the dental school lecture? We, we try to cross pollinate as much as we can, but the curricula aren't really set up. For it, especially now with the systems-based curricula that the medical schools are using. Um, <laughs> mouth's not a system. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, well, thank you. I hope yeah, you broadcast. I walked out at one point, and Travis heard you on his phone. We heard people coughing, heard so people I think they must be, it must be connected again. All right. Yeah. Well, you know what? We can't screw up again until September. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so everybody tonight, everybody's welcome to come this evening. To my knowledge, it's in the same building, starting around six o'clock. And parking's free. Huh? And parking's free. Really free and easy. Uh, you have to get our, you know, the park and Tesla walk. Get your free parking. Uh, uh, car thing. Never anybody uh, takes their mail. But I can give you a contact yeah, information. So I think I'm going to tell you some of it. Did you see you again? Jerry. Yeah. Is he a new player yet? Oh. Did you get a place for me? I love Colorado. I know it's yeah, it's exciting. It's going to color out. Sorry, I'll just be up. It's right on the back of this page. Sorry. Oh, okay. So I have a metal allergy. Okay, it may not be the main one right there. Sounds like the weather. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it means the world to him. Thank you very much. Wow. Mm. No, no, but the white paper is. Tan shoes. They tan shoes with chrome. That's true. In the tanning leather, it's all tanning leather.
I scored that 40 years ago, otherwise I couldn't have it. Thank you so much, that was really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, love to come out. Can you tell me again the yellow marker? So you put it on, then you don't have to worry about it for three more days, you can just see it under your view? Um, well, so I do five days, days right? And here, here's what happens. I ask them to redraw it every day, because they're showering. So you still haven't redrawn it every day? I do, but you know what, I get, I get lots of people who, especially older women who live alone, and, and I just tell them, just try not to get too much water on it, you know, when you shower. Don't scrub it. And usually, five days later, I can still see it. If I turn the room lights down a little bit, and then I retrace it myself. So you put the grid on, so those pictures aren't just what you see on the UV light. And yeah, you retrace you the grid. No. The University of Washington prohibits. Uh, uh, yes, oh. yes. That's what I'm saying. That's the reason it's still there after five years. That one, though, was just right after I took the patches off. Oh, okay. Yeah, they always just run. But, um, yeah, with the, so if, when they, a lot of people come back, and if they've had it for five years, it's very obvious. If they have it, then I have to. Redraw it. And here's this is funny because you can't see it, people write all kinds of things on their love that I can't see until I turn on the screen. Yeah, that's like dramatic graphic people. You see something right on your skin, you don't really want to know what these are. No, I got a case recently. I, I thought it was submitted after you checked it. Yeah, there's only I'm one really published case. I thought they could talk about it. <laughs> I got one, so I'm going to pick it up the most Publish it. And I discovered the monography of my Because um, yeah. she came in for these, these that would come and go, this red irritation that would come and go very quickly. And I loved it. She brushed, she said it would itch a little bit. And I went to do a thyroid exam. She wanted And 15 seconds later, hold, cow. You could see where my thumbs had been, you know, and so on. And I, I said, is that normal for you? She goes, oh yeah, I can write it myself. Yeah, so, and, and I can't find any other reason for this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's the second time we see world or whatever. Yeah. 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 So you like a two week inspection yeah. and show that it comes out? Yeah. 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 You can take a mirror handle and rubber gum and 30 seconds later, there's this big yeah, red line. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> probably wouldn't be a great question. Do you think you could thermally end it? Usually, it's easiest when it's during the That's a question. Somebody's got to be explained. We're going to talk about that. How many things have been done to you? Sure. Yeah, so you have to write a question. Now, okay. I'm so frustrated. So frustrated. Yeah. 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 When I look at it from the side, I start writing. It's you. I didn't use the name of the line. Yes, right now. And I'm just wondering, when you find a grid, and then you put it on there, 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 Okay. Anyway, I just want to let you know that. And then we use the uh, Mark Valentine to the way, I spoke to We have them separate the It's just another two. And they come with a little two and some discreet But our dermatologists, they all read past this at different times. I mean, everybody takes it off at 48 hours. But then most of them cut it off at the end of their life. They don't go to the end of their life. No, I, you know, Mark was talking to all the time. Right. 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 Well, so I sent that list. So now you're, you're telling me that I'm going to just change. Uh, Anita? I don't know what he's doing now. now. I know what he did 25 years ago. Yeah. Terrible. Well, I don't think so he's changed. He's changed. Because we have Mark Valentine and Everett, who's sort of the oh, yeah, yeah. Marshall Mellon yeah, yeah, of Seattle. Yeah, yeah, right. We have him and Everett, but he's yeah. going to retire soon, so then I'm screwed. But anyway, and then you're yeah, and I got a couple of good to go. But anyway, that was awesome. Thank you so much. I had a good time. It's good to see you again. Is, and hopefully you'll come back. Hopefully I'll still be around when you come back. <laughs> I was just going to say, my, uh, my daughter's going to watch you. You've come to see me twice now? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Uh, be so who's going to get back from you? Anita, uh, uh, chronic pain. Yeah. Or yeah. low dose. And yeah. yeah. So, so tell me, because normally they would use higher dose. So tell me about, you know, 
you know, sometime in the next it's month, what you put up is I'll start putting together whatever year out of yeah. session. Oh, I get it. It's <laughs> over the summer. Help okay. that. Or, and I'll look. And I'll have an email you and mention my name. Exactly. All right. Yeah, yeah I got it. It's totally nine. I mean, it's not actually. And that's the cool thing, right? It's a treatment tool. 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 It's a tre